Hello and welcome to another episode of Essential Implementation. Um, a few months ago, I attended the Evidence and Implementation 2021 Summit held by the Center for Evidence and Implementation online. And I was really taken by a talk on rapid cycle design and testing by a group called the Dartington Service Design Lab. One of the speakers, Dion Simpson, a service improvement specialist at Dartington, agreed to come on the podcast to talk about the approach they take in terms of this rapid cycle design. It really struck me as a, an important approach and something which I think contributes a lot to uh, implementation. So Dion Simpson from the Dartington Service Design Lab. Welcome to another episode of Essential Implementation. It's really nice to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Christian. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. I, it, you know, it really resonated with me when you spoke at the conference because you, you explained rapid cycle so eloquently and a really a, a core sort of thread of this podcast has been to try and answer that question, to try and understand how can we balance the sort of scientific rigor with sort of practical needs. Um, because obviously, you know, it, where I work uh, in the NHS, it, it's um, something I've been aware of as well, that you know, the practitioners on the ground generally need sort of practical ways to, to and practical knowledge and, and advice to in ways to implement things and, and support that way, rather than say, uh, you know, just saying, well, well, here's a randomized controlled trial and, and here's an evidence-based practice at the end of it, go away and implement it. We, we know this works, go and implement it. And although the scientific rigor to create that evidence-based practice has been, you know, really, really great, um, it hasn't taken into account necessarily enough of the context to then be implemented well. So, so, so perhaps you could start by um, going through rapid cycle, or at least explaining why you think this is a good way to balance those two needs. So, of course, I do draw heavily on scientific evidence and research methods across all my work. But as someone who also worked in public health as a practitioner, I'm, I'm also very mindful of the reality of delivering interventions in real world contexts. And so I'm always thinking of appropriate ways to balance the need for scientific rigor with what's really practical and relevant for programs and for the people in them. And rapid cycle design and test does help us to do this really, really well. So, you know, as I said, we support mostly social interventions or social programs. And like many healthcare interventions, social interventions can be very complex. So there's often a combination or an involvement of human, social and operational factors within these programs. And these interact and then they have to exist within an equally complex context. And things can be unpredictable and they can change over time. And so as social researchers and evaluators, we've had to contend with this complexity and accept that traditional scientific methods like randomized control trials might not always help us to understand and learn about the how and the why of these social programs and how and why they work. And arguably that sort of evidence might be better for long-term improvement and sustainability than just understanding whether or not it works. Yes. So, yes. of course, because of this complexity, the traditional scientific methods don't always work. And you could say that social programs tend to violate the orderly, predictable assumptions under which the traditional methods do operate best. So these methods do have a place, but then social programs might violate this if you don't take context into account. But and so we need something else to complement these traditional yes. methods. And that's something else that sits along the pathway to being ready for these more traditional scientific methods and um, enter rapid cycle design and testing basically so and I, I, I was just going to say particularly when you're working with children you know out in the community um I, I imagine that they are quite it is quite an unpredictable context isn't it so this is rapid cycle design and testing so it's a five-step method yes so the first step is assess and then there is step two which is design and then step three is implement and observe step four analyze and learn and step five is pause and decide. Mm -hmm. Step one, uh, assess. So this is usually where we do the inception of a program. So we go in, get to know who the collaborators are. So these are the stakeholders that we're working with. And the stakeholders include the managers, practitioners, and the people who are supported by the services, ideally. And the, the purpose of this is really just to get a lay of the land, first of all, so try to understand what the context is and context in terms of who the people are who are being supported, what their needs are, what the program developers believe the problems are and how to address them. Mm. And then we try to understand 
their sense of the theory. So, so what they think the program is meant to achieve and how it will achieve this. We also take a look at what they already have in place in order to uh, go through an improvement process. So we'll look at their processes for data collection, for data analysis, and if they have a learning system in place, if not, we'll help them to develop one. And then we agree on what it is that the improvement project will do or the evaluation will do. So what are the key learning questions and priorities and, and then set an agenda going forward. And we also agree how we'll work together because the, the purpose of this process is to make it collaborative and to bring them along a journey and hopefully develop their capacity. So we will agree on how we'll work together. This method doesn't have to be led by us or with our support for a two year period like we did with the program that I'll, I'll tell you about. It can be led uh, solely by services. So it is an accessible method. So we could introduce uh, this method to a service and then they can go ahead and use it for their own self evaluation and learning. So it, it is that accessible and structured and it's also replicable as well. So, so, so do you think it's possible to, to almost, um, you know, um, like teach this to a service um, and then sort of leave them to it or maybe or maybe and sort of like dip in every every so often to, to, to support them is that possible yeah, I, I think so yeah. i think so. And, and and to be honest that's sort of the approach that i took with the chance uk mentoring service so we weren't necessarily embedded in their team right as a, yeah. an evaluator so it was more working alongside them. And one of the reasons why we did it that way is because we were also learning about the method through that process. Yes. So we've, been, we've been trialing it, as it were, with services. So we want to learn from services as they use this. Yes. So we can make this method better. Yeah. So that's the assess step. And, and one of the main things that comes out of this assess step is the program theory. So it could be a theory of change or a logic model, but it's the the program theory and, um, and a mutual consensus and understanding of what this program is about. And then in the design step, we translate the theory and the research agenda into um, concrete products. So we will design an actual theory of change diagram with narrative to help support uh, understanding across the program and for, for stakeholders to understand what this program is, as well as to guide delivery. And we also use it to design implementation plans, data collection plans, uh, plans for evaluation, activities, Relates to the program itself and any changes or updates that need to be made to the data system and yes. data collection tools. We also do that in the design phase, design step. And, and just to say that in terms of data collection, we, we prioritize using data and tools that already exist within these programs. Again, this program is meant to be embedded within routine practice. So we want this to become the new way of doing things for programs rather yeah, than. Yeah, yeah to be a, a, an external research process that happens to them and then leaves. So we try to use what they already have and then make improvements based on the program theory. So if, if the program theory suggests certain new components that they hadn't previously measured or um, certain assumptions, for example, that they'd need to, to add tools or data in order to evidence, then we will add those. But we prefer to start where they are and then build from there because it adds less burden. It makes uptake and, and buy-in a lot easier and it makes embedding a lot easier as well. Of course. Yeah. Th that was what, uh, when I interviewed Laura Damschrader, um, I think it was back in September now, last year, um, she was explaining how she likes to, to teach receptive teams in the setting to continually, continually optimize the intervention over time. And that's how you can make sure it's sustained even after the research team has left. Yeah. yeah, and that idea of, because this is part of a process of learning and improving and, and with rapid cycle design and testing, it's we make small changes. So in the assess step, you might identify a lot of things that need to change and improve. And I suppose one of the reasons why organizations might struggle to improve is because there's just too much to improve. So it's easier to do mm -hmm. nothing um, when you don't know where to start. So mm -hmm. with the theory of change will help to, to narrow down the focus. On, on what it is that really drives change within this program yeah. and therefore what you can prioritize in terms of your improvement. And then we make small changes. And because it is a psychic process, there is freedom in, in, in making those small changes because you know that if it doesn't work, you could respond by, by fixing that. And if it does work, you can continue and then build on that by adding yes. changes. That's very different from say, I guess it's a different sort of, pressure it's like the pressure's taken off isn't it you know it's not like we have to get this right 
and get this implemented this way in this form. Um, no, you're almost saying we can almost tolerate some uncertainty. Yeah. We can almost take a few risks in getting this implemented well, where we, we can make mistakes and then we can correct them as we go around the cycle. Yeah. 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 Which is which is reassuring and, and it's really interesting that that we don't naturally think that way because the default is to, to trust a long process, for example, uh, where you think you'll get definitive answers, but so much can happen during that long period, which yeah. is also risky. So you may find out at the end of a long period that you really weren't making any positive changes. And in fact, there were lots of negative changes that were happening or negative results that were happening that you did nothing about, which is also uh, potentially dangerous and unsettling. So, so I think it is helpful to have a method like this where you can see what's happening and yeah. you can make small changes and you can embrace uncertainty because these things are uncertain complex social programs are uncertain yeah predictable so this helps you to, to acknowledge yeah. that and to, to work with it and accommodate it in an in an evidence-based way and uh, and then step three is implement and observe so this is where implementation of the program actually starts so they start using the tools implementing the plans delivering activities to the people that they support and data has been collected during this period. Mm. So we, we define monitoring uh, as maybe monthly. So we'll, well, depending on, on how long the program is and how long cycles are, but this is regular. So it could be weekly, could be monthly, mm. looking at the data that's being collected. And the purpose during implementation and observation is mostly to note if things are happening as you theorized or expected. So this gives you an opportunity to respond to any, any adverse events that might be happening uh, or, or any unexpected changes that aren't necessarily positive. I mean, you, if you notice the positive ones, then you can also respond in a good way to that, but it helps you to check for adverse events. And to give an example, for programs that we've worked with during this step, we usually notice problems with data collection and data entry or system glitches, yeah. for example, that's a typical <laughs> problem that services have, especially when, when the programs are very new. So if they are doing this for the first time and they've introduced changes to their data system or ha have to introduce new data collection tools, then they would have to train their staff to use these tools. So then of course the uptake from that takes time mm -hmm. and being able to enter data properly and um, uh, accurately and frequently might be a challenge for some. So we get to spot those issues very early in the implementation and observation phase. Yes, uh, and yes. then we can we can respond to that rather than waiting, for example, until months or or years later. And then the only thing you can say is, well, we can't use this data because the quality isn't very good. And so, I, I'm sure we'll go through an example of, the, of these, but I just wondered, I'm really keen to know what what might that look like, say, in this um in the project that you've been talking about, uh, the mentoring. Um, projects uh, would it be sort of the the people working with the children would they be sort of inputting data into a computer or or something like that yeah so for lots of the programs that we support they use uh, electronic data collection rather yeah. than paper so they may collect paper while they're in the field as it were but then they do enter it into their data systems yes and then what we do with them is say monthly we might have a check-in for longer programs for shorter programs, it might be weekly check-in. And then we also work with what works for them. So they may already have a process of reviewing data. Some mm. don't, but if they have a process of reviewing data, and if this happens every six weeks or so, then we might work with that. But the idea is to encourage them to routinely look at the data that they're collecting and to look at it, not with a clinician's lens on, um, but more with a researcher lens. So we teach them how to apply a researcher lens. And what that means is they're very good at mm. looking at data in order to prepare for a one-to-one -one or a group engagement with the people that they're surveying. Yeah. So yes. And then the analyze and learn step is where you will co collate the data that you've been collecting so far. And then you will analyze this data. And this will be based on the theory of change or logic model that you had established at the very beginning. Yes. So you have some questions that you, or hypotheses that you set based on this theory. And then in the analyze and learn step, you're comparing what you expected to happen based on your hypothesis with what you've really observed. And you'll try to think about why this might be happening. Mm. And you'll rely on both quantitative and qualitative data in order to understand this. So the qualitative data might be feedback from staff, feedback from young people or children in our case. And 
the quantitative data will be data on the process measures. And if you're looking at outcomes on the outcomes as well, and then you put them together and try to understand and draw insights from, from what it is that you've analyzed. Mm. And then there's a pause and decide step, which is a dedicated meeting or, or workshop or a session. So this is a purposeful break um, in, in what you're doing to reflect as a team. So we usually do this with stakeholders to gather around the insights that you've generated from step four and try to understand what it's saying, to look at it from your, the perspective of your theory of change. And then mm. if you're seeing things that you didn't hypothesize, you try to generate some alternative explanations for this. And this is why it helps to have uh, a diverse group within the room because they'll offer different perspectives and explanations for what might be happening. And then based on those explanations, you'll agree on what's been learned from this. So there is a period, so it's not just studying, but you're learning from this and then you will mm. come up with some actions. So you'll make some decisions about what could happen next. Um, I, I think it's it's very yeah it's very nice to see you and uh, as I say very um, uh, very well uh, articulated. So that is the end of part one of my interview with Dion. We also have a part two where we go into a lot more detail about rapid cycle design and testing. And Dion very kindly gives us a real world example of when she has applied this. So if you want to know more detail, um, I would really recommend watching part two. Uh, thanks for watching this part and I hope to see you again.